This meeting is called to order. This is the January 14th meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the bills, payrolls, and warrants. So moved. Second. Okay, motion second. Any further discussion? Do we none? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, item two is to approve the minutes of January 7th, but they're not ready. So we'll hold that off till um, next meeting. Uh, are there any announcements this evening? I think there were a couple, right? A few. I didn't write those down. Okay. Uh, let's see. The first one is a notice to the people in the area of uh, uh, prospects. Oh, actually, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Nadnock Drive, Maple Ave, Roslindale, Main Street, 140 from Main Street to Melody Lane. Um, there's several areas in town. You can check it on the website um, where our contractor is going to be exercising valves and doing some highway flush, um, hydrant flushing um, over the next couple of days, weather permitting. So. The possibility, because they're doing that, you might get some brown water, but um, if you run your tap for a few minutes, it should clear out. Um, it's a necessary part of the process to get all the uh, manganese out of the, out of the pipes. Um, <coughs> this week uh, is the second, I believe, in the last week for Christmas trees, right? Um, to pick up your Christmas trees, so um, get them out at the curb and... They'll be picked up if you put them out this week. And next week is Martin Luther King Day, but even though it's a holiday, um, we're not going to have a delay uh, next week on picking up trash. So uh, if you were normally a Monday uh, pickup, um, and it, it, traditional holidays, it would be Tuesday. Um, this time around, uh, Monday is Monday. There's no one-day delay, so um, we're going to be sending out notices on that also, but uh, just so people are aware. I think, did I get them on? There's no? one more area of flushing. Um, okay, that's not the same as you. Um, there's also going to be flushing going on, and actually I believe it, no, that's, yeah, that's tomorrow and Thursday. Um, Hill Street, uh, the Planets, uh, part of Prospect Street, Redcoat Circle, Aiden, Brochane Circle, Merriam Ave, that whole area up there, Prospect between Prospect Street and um, Route 140 will also be having hydrant flushing tomorrow. And I think that's it, right? That's good. Okay. Um, Mr. Manager, do you have anything to report this evening? I do. I have a couple things. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to let everyone know and encourage everyone to take the opportunity to welcome our new Council on Aging Director, Holly Luke, who started um, a week ago Monday and um, is up and, up and running um, over at the COA. So if you have the opportunity to stop in and say hi to her, please do so. Um, I also wanted to, um, and I'm glad he's here, congratulate Keith Baldinger on completing his um, building operator certification course, which included 74 hours of training, seven examinations, and five project assignments. And this was part of our Green Communities Program um, and will certainly benefit the community uh, for years to come with this um, certification that he received. So congratulations, Keith. Um, I wanted to advise the board um, that I have submitted an offer that's been accepted and signed a purchase and sales agreement, uh, which will be continued on town meeting approval for 268 North Quinn Sigmund Avenue. Uh, this is a piece of property that we saw strategically as it aligns um, with other town owned land in the vicinity of our drinking water wells. Um, so we will seek town meeting approval using uh, water funding to acquire this uh, piece, hopefully and close on it in the spring. And, uh, finally, I received word today that Pharmacan, who will uh, do business under the name of Verilife at 939 Boston Turnpike, uh, has received their provisional license from the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, and they have begun demolition on that 
uh, property on the interior and submitted for their building permit. So they are making process under the three month window that the board has for their host community. Okay. Anything else this evening? That is it. That's it. Okay, first order of business then is uh, a joint meeting and presentation from the uh, with the Public okay. Lands Committee to hear the report on the progress of the committee relative to research on town-owned land. I see some members of the committee here. If you'd like to come up to the, the table, we have a discussion. <clears throat> I'm going, to, I'm going to try doing this from here. Um, I thought I was, we were going to be running the, uh, the laptop, but we're not. Um, so anyways, as, uh, to, to start, let me first introduce um, uh, the members of the committee who are here. Martha Gauch from the Conservation Commission, Keith Baldinger, which was, you were a resident at, at, at resident at large, yeah. even though you subsequently became a town employee. And Christopher Kirk, who is um, representing uh, Friends of Prospect Park. Um, as the board uh, knows, uh, back in August of 2018, uh, we created the Public Lands Committee to basically research um, the town properties um, for any limitations on any of the town properties um, because we ran into an issue in. Uh, the building committee started looking for a site for the Beale School and thought they might have had a site and found out that it was under Chapter 97? Article. Article 97. And um, which meant it was protected land and it, people didn't really realize that that's how we acquired it. So in any event, um, we formed the committee of, uh, of uh, different boards. Um, uh, I was on it. Um, Martha, obviously, um, Susan Caldwell from the Trails Committee, um, Christopher Kirk from the Finance Committee, Judy Vetter, um, Keith, and Mary Ellen uh, Rodinovic um, were on as citizens at large. We also had um, tremendous staff support from Dan McCollin in the Engineering Department. So. We had our first meeting in September of 2018, and we spent that meeting trying to figure out exactly how we were going to do what we were charged to do. Uh, and that, as the discussion went on, we decided that we had a list of town properties. There were 446, and uh, there were eight of us, so we basically coincidentally had eight pages of property listings, and we divided those up and agreed that each member would do the research on those properties uh, by researching the deeds and um, trying to discover if there were any limitations on the transfer uh, when the land was acquired by the town. And so um, we, we did that. Um, fortunately for us, several years ago, an intern for the engineering department collected all the data up on, he did it about eight years ago. So all the deeds that could be found for the properties that the town owned uh, were collected, copied, scanned, and saved. And Dan was able to take the property list and tie the deeds into uh, those property lists on the GIS on a, there's a page on the GIS that's not public yet that we were able to use, and if we clicked on a site, if there was a deed, we could find the deed instead of have, having to go through the registry of deeds. So it really speeded up the process. In any event, um, as we expected, there were a bunch of properties that we couldn't find the deeds for or were very difficult to understand. Uh, so what we did was we put those aside and uh, just made a list of them and came back to them at the end or if somebody had time um, they could try to look them up. Um, as a result of that, though, we only had 19 properties in the end that we couldn't find deeds for, um, which was uh, pretty amazing, really. 
Um, and most of those properties happen to be around Jordan Pond, so I don't think we're going to build a school right on the water, so I don't think that would be an issue. But in any event, um, so we had six more meetings uh, from September until last June. We basically finished our work, and um, originally we were going to come before the board in July, but we got busy as a board and um, found out there was some other work that needed to be done on the list, so uh, kind of dragged on a bit. Um, but we did complete the work um, about a month or so ago. Um, Dan McCullen and I uh, spent some time um, trying to clarify some of the descriptions, and Dan uh, cleaned up our, uh, how we identified the properties and helped put them into categories so that we knew what types of property that they were. Um, so, having said that, we're at the point we're at now where we actually have um, a color-coded uh, page on the GIS that'll, that'll go live at some point where all the properties that the town owns are identified and they're color-coded by the category of property that they are in terms of the restrictions. So if it was conservation land, if it was parks, if it was unrestricted, if it was open space, it's all color-coded, uh, and we can now go to the GIS, um, go on the, the information button, click on the property, uh, and the information will come up and say um, what type of property it is, et cetera. So that's, um, that's what we've done. It, it took a long time to do this. It was a, a slow process because, like I said, some of the, some of the deeds were difficult to read. One of them was handwritten. I think we found one in the late 1700s. Um, it was a little difficult. We still haven't figured out what that means, but we know we own it. Um, uh, so um, we've gotten to the point now where we can report to the board, I think with a high degree of confidence, um, on what the circumstances are of each of these um, categories and some others that aren't listed on the draft report that um, I sent out to the board. I, I listed uh, by um, acreage um, from the largest to the smallest, um, the different categories of land um, and what we uncovered. Uh, unrestricted um, is land that had nothing in a deed that said um, anything in particular could or could not be done. There were 86 of those properties and um, they comprise 524 acres. Conservation land, um, 44 parcels, 348 acres. Open space, most of which um, came as a result of land that was acquired through the cluster subdivision bylaw, uh, is 273 acres. Tax title land, which, which is an interesting um, category, it's all land, obviously, it was taken for non-payment of taxes, going back to the early 1900s. That property is still in tax title. It, it's still under that, the, that control. So technically, that land is under the, the custodianship of a custodial... Tax title custodian. Tax, to, tax title custodian, who's a tax collector. Um, and that land actually is restricted. Nothing can be done with that land except... It could be sold um, through auction, <clears throat> or we would have to go to town meeting if we wanted to change the designation. Town meeting would have to vote out of it. But um, there were 70 parcels, I mean, uh, there's 123 parcels of tax title land. Um, a lot of small parcels, but 120 acres. Um, what is characterized as municipal land, which really is just for any municipal purpose. Um, theoretically unrestricted, um, 110 acres. Recreation and playground is 139 acres. Um, water purposes, um, again, a uh, special classification. Um, if it was taken for water purposes, for drinking water supply, that water is, I mean, that land is protected. And I believe you have to go to town meeting to do a home rule petition and then go to the state to get even a sliver of it taken out 
of that of that category. There's 96 acres of that uh, currently. Um, land for school purposes is 64 acres, but that does not include um, the high school property because that deed, um, we, well, we can't find it, but it's not clear if it was taken for school purposes or it was taken for um, just municipal purposes. Not that it makes that much difference because the school is on the property, but um, we were going by what the deed said, um, not what may have happened later because we'd have to go into every town meeting from when that land was acquired, um, all the lands were acquired to see if anything had changed. Um, and then finally, um, cemetery, we have 42 acres, six parcels, and we've got those 19 parcels um, that are further review. Essentially, it's about 30 acres or so, but it's listed as 225 because um, we need to clarify the high school, um, high school property. And then there's 38 miscellaneous properties, um, 198 acres, and one of those pro pieces of property is Prospect Park because it's not 100% clear what the status of that land is. Um, it wasn't taken for playground purposes, but I believe town meeting voted to take it for playground purposes, so somebody who's got a lot more expertise than, than we do is going to have to decipher that. Um, in any event, um, in closing, and then I'll open it up to members of the board and, and members of the committee if they want to add anything. Um, as far as next step, we're, we're essentially done with what we would charge to do. Uh, but the committee feels and um, the board, um, I think, is going to have to decide, um, and per perhaps the planning department, if we'd like to continue the process and look at parcels of land that might be contiguous to each other, that might have desi different designations that we want, might want to uh, combine under the, the same category. In other words, we have some land that's conservation land and there's a bunch of tax title land next to it um, that it, the one particular place it's down by um, Artemis and, and uh, some streets down there, it, it's wet. Uh, and it, it looks, you know, when you take a look at it, that it, it should be one piece of property, so it, it should stay protected. There are other pieces that we might want to change from uh, some categories that they probably shouldn't be in. Um, they don't make sense now. Maybe in the 1900s when they were bought, they, they were taken for a particular purpose. Um, in any event, members of the, uh, of the committee um, would be interested in working on that and bringing those uh, and working with the uh, planning department and bringing suggestions such as those I just mentioned um, back to the board and see if there's any interest in changing the categories to offer more protection to the land. And that's what we have. Um, I would just like to say um, Dan McCullen made this process immensely easier. Um, with his support um, and his help, it was it really was amazing because if you if you have gone through the effort of going through the registry of deeds and trying to find all that stuff, it, it, sometimes it's easy, most times it's not. Um, he did a great job. That map that map helped a lot, um, and um, I really want to thank him. He he was going to be here tonight, but something came up and he couldn't make it. So, um, anybody on the committee have anything you want to add? Any thoughts? I'd just like to add that um, Mo, I think, stays up at night looking up these <laughs> properties. I mean, you've certainly done a ton of work for the whole, throughout the whole um, process. Um, <coughs> over and above, I think. So. Anybody have any questions? Mr. Lubov? Well, not so much a question. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think this is fabulous work. I mean, the, the, the deliverable, I think, is going to be helpful to the town for a, a long time. I mean, not just if anything immediate comes out of it. I, I think what you've put together, I think this is a problem a lot of towns have and don't always have the time, the energy, the resources, the staff, whatever you want to call it, to do it. And it's not always the highest priority, but 
to know your inventory of what you have and what restrictions may be on it is huge. Um, and to be able to know that right away rather than to have to go through the process for each one of these parcels if you're examining certain parcels is, is, is greatly helpful. So I just want to acknowledge that I think uh, great work and uh, a great result. As, as far as your suggestion, Mr. Chairman, about uh, continuing the committee's work. You don't uh, need to decide that. Okay. Tonight. I mean, I just want to no. think about that a little bit. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. Um, it's whether it's whether or not we want to take it to the next step that way. Um, I just wanted the, the board to know that if if there was interest in doing that, there is interest by people on the committee to continue that work. Anyone else? No. No? I just I really this map is so interesting and I just want to thank you all for the effort that you put into this. Um, I was really excited when I saw it blown up because I was looking at it on my iPad and it's almost impossible. So I'm going to start driving around now and really thinking more about the different pieces of land. And when I'm wondering, I wonder what that land is doing, I can now go home and figure out exactly what's happening there. So thank you so much for the effort. And I could really see, like we talked last night, um, we had our first uh, meeting to work on the RFP for the Beale project, uh, the not the project, the, the school in the center of town. So when it becomes something else. We can start uh, shaping that. And you were mentioning the, the ball field and how there's other places in town where it can go if that is to move. And now you can really clearly see uh, what would make sense as far as where we could move that and what the options are. And yeah, Thanks. The other, the other thing that um, I realized would be helpful um, after we had Lillian identified clearly on the map, um, was if we ever had money to purchase open space, um, you can see easily parcels of land that we own, and um, a lot of times you can tell if the land's vacant or not. And I think it would help I'm trying to see if it makes sense if we ever have the money. I mean, we we did once when we did that bond. Um, there are pe uh, private properties that are contiguous to some of those town-owned properties that are vacant. And it could be an opportunity in, in the future, but I, I think it's going to help a lot once people get used to using it, um, seeing, you know, what's out there. So, anyways, Mr. Samia? Just a quick question on, and may not have gotten into this much detail, on the tax title, 123 parcels, do you know roughly how many of those have structures on them? Um, almost none of them. Okay. Almost none. Okay. I, I found one today, um, I, I, I can't stop. I don't know. I, I get this compulsion about trying to get them all right, but um, I found one that had a, some kind of a shed on it. Okay. Um, but it's mostly, a lot of the land is wet um, or it has some kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, others, um, it just, for some reason, people just let it go. Um, they just decided not to pay. Who knows, you know, if they had financial hardship or whatever. Um, so, um, there's really Nothing. I mean, we sold the one that had okay. that had the property. The Allen Funeral Home. The only one that I, that really jumped out that actually had a building on it. Okay. Thank you. So, anyways, well, nothing else. You want to add anything? No? I'd just like to say that um, that I I agree, and I'm glad that you find the map so valuable, and I'm glad you find the work valuable valuable because I think it allows us to be strategic about future planning as we as we go forward and we're thinking about open space and we're thinking about community character um, we we now have a tool and Beth as much as you like that map in its static form <coughs> wait until you can click on things <laughs> <laughs> now, I was trying that on my iPad it did not work no. so I'm looking forward to being able to do that so when I click on it what will it what will it bring up it'll it'll bring up a map like it'll bring up a map like that and the way it works now, if you're familiar with it, on the, on the left-hand side, there's different categories of things that you can do. Like you could put the zoning map, you could do this, do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a section that lists every one of those categories. And you can just click on one category, you can click on two, you can click on all. Um, so you can see how the parcels go together. Um, we just 
um, Dean's going to do some work to clean it up, and I think through engineering they're going to have to decide when they want to release it. But um, there's 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 nothing secretive about it, so it should it should be soon. But That's great. Um, and it it is relatively easy to correct things if we find something that might be classified wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, just the way those led what's on the legend on the side there. Right. Um, you could click on any one of those on that GIS screen and it will call up those categories. It will call up all of them, one, three, whatever. So it filters them, basically. It filters, yeah. Um, it, it, it really is, uh, it's interesting when you, when you start looking into <laughs> it. But anyways, um, okay, well, I really want to thank uh, uh, the other members of the committee because um, this really was tedious work. Um, we had a couple people, I'm not, I'm not sure in the beginning what they thought we were going to do, um, but um, it was all research, and um, it took some staying with it sometimes to, to try to get it right, and um, it's been, well, it's really been about a year because we finished up for the most part in June, but um, uh, it was a long process, and um, we all stuck with it, so I want to thank you for your help. And hopefully we'll get to do something with it in the future. So thank you very much. Okay. The next order of business is a 710 public hearing with John Litchfield, uh, proposed manager of the Ad Adelphi Inc. DBA Knights of Columbus, 206 South Pensacoma Avenue for a change of manager and alteration of premises to their all alcohol Club license. Mr. Litchfield, would you like to come up? Good evening. Good evening. So, you are here this evening because um, you're requesting a change of manager to make you the manager. Yes. And because you sold um, the building um, to the people who own Struck Catering. You now only occupy the first floor. the first floor. Correct. And so it's just it's paperwork that has to be done for the ABCC that you're not going to have two bars anymore. You have one. Correct. Um, is there any, anything else that's changing besides that? No, the only, no, that's the only thing that changes. We sold the property in the building. We have a long-term lease, which we documented and submitted. So we're just staying downstairs in what formerly was called the members' quarters, and that's where we meet now, it's just for our own use. So the idea was just to split it because we have both floors on the license and just the first floor now for us. Right. Okay. Any questions from members of the board? Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anybody who would like to be heard on this matter? Okay. There being none, what's the pleasure of the board? Move we close the hearing. Second. Okay. We have a motion to second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So Thank you very much. Well, wait a minute. Oh, hold on. That, was, that was the part to close the hearing. Okay. Now we have to decide if we're going to let you do it. Um, so anyways, um, what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. LeBeau. I move the board approve the license application of uh, John Litchfield, manager, Adelphi, Inc., DBA, Knights of Columbus, 206 South Quinsigamon Ave for a change of manager and alteration of premises to their all alcohol club license as expressed in the application. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All set. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good night, folks. Okay, our next order of business is a public hearing with Amir Hanna, owner of AG United Incorporated DBA 711, 38 Maple Avenue for a wine and malt beverages package store license. Good evening. Would you like to come forward? I have some uh, paperwork <coughs> to show. Okay. So would you like to introduce yourself for the... Yes, uh, I'm Jehan Mosef, um, partner with Amir Hanna. Okay. I'm his wife and we run the business two okay. together. Um, this is um, a copy of the experience. So I have only three copies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, you want to you want to tell us anything about what it is you want to do? Um, yeah, we're just applying for um, the license for the beer and wine um, to to be able to um, 
balance a little bit of the business after cutting the flavor, the electronic cigarettes and all this part and then trying to survive a little bit. And in June, we don't know what's going to happen uh, also. And uh, we did, we did um, take the opinion of uh, some of the customers and you have the paperwork that the customers mm -hmm. sign um, to um, agree that you can uh, to help us um, right this is a, this is a list of people in support yes okay. and then uh, the two pages um, show that we um, we've been in this location for 12 years we never had any violation whatsoever under anything for cigarettes for uh, minor or lottery or anything and even from the 7-eleven itself they have uh, on the system we cannot sell anything the message come on the screen and I took a picture of it and then you add it for the lottery, it has to be 18 years old. And for the cigarettes, it has to be 21 years old. And um, otherwise, we cannot sell. These are the examples of the 7-Eleven is keeping track of what we are doing. So they send a secret shopper to the stores to make sure that we are not selling anything uh, for minor or anything. And we also, we all the time get green card. We never get any red card. So. This is, this is it. This is what we will try to uh, explain it. So, questions from members of the board? Mr. Osamia? Where would the beer and wine, where would it be in the store? Where are you thinking? Um, it's going to be um, um, one door um, um, in the vault. They will take one door and uh, it will be beer and wine. It's not going to be like a big selection. It's going to mm. be like a minimum uh, selection of that. And... Um, I think we're going to have like a one display for uh, boxes, not uh, not something si uh, single. The single will be in the vault. Okay. And like the, um, the most of the 7-Eleven, they have uh, beer and wine, mm -hmm. and this is the way they they put they display the beer and wine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Mr. I'm sorry. Does it? Uh, are you telling us anywhere, or am I just missing it? What hours do you propose to sell alcohol? Um, it's from uh, 8 to um, 11 during the weekdays and from um, 10 or 11 uh, till 10 at night on Sunday. Is, are, those, are those hours allowed? I don't think we so. We talked about this the other day. Um, I, like I was just looking at it. I think it is mm -hmm. 11. It says grocery and convenience stores can sell beer and wine from 8 to 11, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Saturday. No alcohol <coughs> sales can begin before noon on Sunday. Right. Okay. Okay, so before noon? Right. On, on Sunday. On Sunday. Um, I think there was that that change to 10 a.m. To 10. Um, so you're open 24 hours, right? Yes. <coughs> so what are you going to do to make sure that it's um, not okay. sold in the hours that you're not supposed to sell. Um, you have a gate, we close it like all 7 11. At a certain time, we have to close this section. So after 11 o'clock, we can't sell closed. any. Okay. Like, like, the, like the markets do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just one other yes. question. A lot of times you'll get a lot of young kids yes. that will walk up there. Is yeah. that going to be visible from where? whoever's man, manning the register to be able to see either by camera or there are going to be barriers to being no, able to see No, we will the put the beer and wine at the last, because we have like... Uh, we have 16 cameras in the store. Yep. And um, we have the busiest time when the kids come in. It's only on Friday from uh, 2.40, 2.40 till 3.30. Okay. At this time, we have, we have like three or four people working in the store to be around the kids and two on the register. So we always prepare. Okay. To not to do any problems. Okay, thank you. But we're, I, I'm not clear. I mean, I, I know the store, but is it going to be in the back corner or the front? The, the end of the case down in the back of the store or up um, towards the front? I, I think um, I will suggest to be very helpful for us too to take the first door mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's going to be under the vision of everybody in the store. Plus, even if they decide to put it on the last door, it's going to be under the cameras. We have, like I said, we have 16 cameras. We have TV in the front, in the back, in mm -hmm. the back room. So everything is like under 
our eyes all the time. So who in your organization would make the decision of where it went? 100% um, it's me, uh, but if they see that it's the best seller has to be like in the beginning of, but if something uh, has to be like immediate decision, I would prefer to put it in the first door and to keep it just in front of my eyes. And then when I close it um, with the gate, it's going to be easier for me. Okay. So it's only going to be one door? I think so, because I can't cut a lot of uh, beverage. I sell more on a soda and Red Bull okay. and stuff like that. So That's not very big. It's only, what, three feet or so? Um, yeah, maybe maybe it's going to be one or two doors, the maximum, because I have a lot of variety of uh, soft drink and, and a lot of things. So um, unless if they would like to um, bring another uh, three doors and put it for me uh, instead of the ice chest or something like that, uh, I didn't discuss it yet with them. You're talking about 7-Eleven? 7-Eleven, yeah, because okay. any, any movement for the... Um, uh, for the machines, it has to be through them. Yeah, they have to pull it. Uh, they have to bring it because it's um, it's their cost to bring the machine. Yeah. But it's my cost to have the inventory. Okay. Okay. Any so, other questions? Mrs. Right now, Cassidy? it sounds like it's going to be one case, <laughs> one cooler door. Um, it's it, yeah. It's uh, it's a, it's between one or two doors. Um, <clears throat> right now, for the vault that I have, because I can cut more than this from my other stuff, like I said. Right, but um, how would we, I would want to know if it were to be more, is what I'm <coughs> saying. Like if, we it, could just, if you were to we just, yeah, restrict it. I would like to know if there was going to be more than just the two doors. We can restrict it in the license. Just say Only it. because, as Mr. Sammy was saying, there's so many middle school kids yeah. that come through there. And I think it's great that you have your eyes on them. And I know, you know, my own, daughter goes through also and yeah. I've never had any sort of issue or problem so I know that you are doing your job in supervising appropriately at those times when the when the students are there um, but I do think that you know the the larger the display the more tempting it is I don't think it's going to be more than two doors 100 percent okay. I don't think so because um like I said I I sell a lot of things in um it's a um, very limited place <laughs> to put the stuff. So I don't think it's going to be more than two doors, and I guarantee that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from members of the board? Mr. LeBeau? You, your business is in Shrewsbury. According to your application, you live in Shrewsbury. Yes. What's in Webster? What do I see Main Street, Webster? Uh, oh. We have another location, another 7-Eleven in Webster. I see. Yeah. So... Um, as the, um, the address for the company. That's the corporate they, they address? Put, yes, the corporate address. Do you have a liquor license there? No, it's not available in the town. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board? Okay, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody in the public that would like to be heard on this? Yes. Uh, yes, sir, you were the first. Yep. Could you just identify yourself for the record? Yeah, my name's Kevin Hickey. I own Hickey's Liquors. Yeah. Like the main problem I would have, I don't know if you've ever been there on a Friday during school when all, the kids, when all the kids get out. There must be about 50 kids that, that are going to pile into the 7 Eleven and they're going to be all over the place. That's going to be very hard to monitor, I would think. <coughs> and there's a lot of kids. They need a police officer outside just, just to, to, to direct traffic. And you get a lot of young kids with that stuff available to them. You know, I don't think it's like a good idea. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Peter Wang, King's Head of the um, I'm opposed to this, not about drinking or anything, but um, one doesn't sound like it's completely thought out. Uh, one possible, one going to or whatever. And it is a high traffic area, high pedestrian area, uh, good time of the day. And there's an ample place to kind of buy as much liquor as you want out here in Hawaii. Each end of Main Street, down the Fairlong, Broad City, Engineer, uh, down by Flynn's. Uh, you can get it pretty much anywhere. <coughs> uh, and for another one, I mean, it's pretty good way. It just seems like what the point is, and it's such a small area being assigned <coughs> to that by respect the, the owner's interest in wanting to grow their business. It seems like it would not be significant to have more congestion or more problems possible 
but also the police department has one more place to look. Um, so, as a lot of young people who are behind the counter, um, they have different ways of thinking about how this is going to make it. So, that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, somebody else had to hear that? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Nick Polacron, a long-time property owner here in Shrewsbury. Um, it's interesting to hear Amir and Gigi talk about a secret shopper for 7-Eleven um, at the sound of or I'm going to date myself now. Remember when it used to be White Hen, my cousin used to be an area manager, and he would always ask me, How's, how are things going at the store? I would be there all the time, and... I have to tell you that every time I was there, the store was always clean, well cared for, and then when it came under the uh, brand of 7-Eleven, same story, always well cared for. People going in there, it was almost like family. So to help augment their business, which is kind of teetering now, to allow them to have a beer and uh, wine license or beer and malt liquor license, I think it would be very helpful. And I would ask for your consideration and your approval on their behalf. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> excuse me for my voice. I've been sick lately, but uh, when I heard about this hearing... Can, excuse me, can you just identify yourself for yeah, the record? Yeah, Bushadi, resident of Shrewsbury. Okay. Uh, so uh, I heard about this hearing today, and I gladly want to cast my vote towards uh, approval of Mr. Hanna. Um, everybody has an opinion about liquor, you know, kids. I, myself, I'm a six-year-old, and actually drags me there to buy him Slurpee, and he knows exactly where everything is. Uh, but I can attest to Mr. Hanna's uh, due diligence around young age, uh, because I've worked for him, um, you know, part-time. And I can tell that uh, both him and uh, Mrs. Hanna do a great job, uh, you know, following up with, uh, with young age and issues like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. My name is Gene Budnagin. I own the property adjacent to the 7-Eleven, which is the Dunkin' Donuts. I'm strictly against having a liquor license issue where you've got a full-service package store right next door. <coughs> I don't think there's any need of it. The other thing I think that will happen if you issue one to the 7-Eleven, the mobile will be next, the shell will be next. And I don't think that's what we're trying to do in the summer. I think we're looking at the center of Shrewsbury. A lot of changes coming up in the very near future. I don't think we need all these additional bear and wine licenses. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Anybody else on the board have any other questions? Question about? I have a question actually for Ms. Clemmy. What do we have for licenses? Would you know off the top of your head an inventory of unused licenses? Uh, for beer and wine, I believe we have seven left. <laughs> and just off the top of my head, I can verify. Thank you. Beer and wine pack is the license. Correct. Yeah. I have a question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, are you planning to sell singles in the case? What are you, six packs? What are we, what are you thinking for inventory? Um, singles and, and uh, six packs in a cooler mm -hmm. and uh, boxes uh, for the display because I don't want to keep anything open, so it's going to be boxes on the Boxes floor. of wine? Um, boxes no, of bo boxes of the the beer cases like the of beer pack. twelve the pack. Case, okay yeah the cases it's gonna be like uh, one display um, closed boxes okay anyone else yes <clears throat> um, Angela Snell I'm also a resident of Shrewsbury. Um, I just want now you're talking about a display of beer so is there two coolers and a display like a third area it's, and where would that be in the store no it's not it's not the, like a, another display but it's like the the back stock uh, of what we're supposed to put in the cooler but it's going to be boxes um on the, on the, in the corner um and it, this is not going to be like a, a display but it's this whatever left from the stock from the company I'm, i can't order like um, one case, I have to order a certain amount. So whatever I can fill in these two doors, and the rest it's going to be on the shelf. Um, so I have a follow-up question. Um, when the 
alcohol is not for sale, how do you secure that section then? And it's the same way. You can uh, put a cover on it and you can put like the yellow label on it that it's not for sale at the time that we are not supposed to sell anything. Uh, by the way, I have to add something. Uh, I worked in, um, in a convenience store. Before I had my own store, I worked uh, for years in a store, in a convenience store in Framingham. We used to sell uh, beer and wine. And every night, on Saturday night, uh, we close all the, all the doors together with one chain. Close everything, and we open it at 10 o'clock the next day. So I know exactly how to deal with this, to secure <coughs> there is no sale or no, nothing wrong going on, especially with holidays. I get too many attempts for people who come on Thanksgiving Day asking me, I can get like a bottle of wine, I can pay whatever, and there is no way. So I already went through this before I get my own store. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Did anybody else want to make comment? Yes, sir. Uh, Amr Muhammad. Uh, I also have a 7-Eleven in Worcester, um, and I also sit on the board of the we have a 7-Eleven corner franchisee. Yeah. So I really appreciate all the concerns from everybody, and it, it is a you know concern probably for the business around that. But it, you know everybody was saying the significance of beer and wine license. We find that lately, you know, it's a lot of it's a challenge for a lot of owners to maintain their business. Since, I mean, as you all know, tobacco and licensing for the cigarettes, it's all gonna go June, menthol. It's gonna go from all the convenience stores. So all, most of our owners in 7-Eleven, they're trying to find another avenue to make up the losses for that, uh, the cigarette ban, you know, the menthol ban. That's, it's, it's imperative for the business to, to make up the, because 40%, if you lose 40% of cigarettes, it's really, it's, it's really imperative to keep the business going, you know, by adding. So a lot of owners did that, you know, they went to beer and wine license, trying to add few things to make up for that loss. So it, it is significant to them. It may not be as, you know, maybe it's one door or two doors, may not be that much for other people, but it is significant to, to their livelihood, you know. Uh, and as far as, uh, you know, kids, <laughs> You know, uh, as far as kids, everybody <coughs> the kids issue. I mean, there is in the system, like you know, Hannah, uh, Gigi said, it is in our system. It's implemented. No one can sell uh, a, a wine or cigarettes unless you see that screen in front of you. And knowing them, you know, they've been there for 12, 15 years, and I'm sure they're gonna watch that as they watch their cigarettes. So it's it's their livelihood. But that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, just just for people's information, uh, liquor licenses are allocated by the state based on population. Um, you get so many licenses per thousand people for a full alcohol restaurant, beer and wine restaurant, package store, all alcohol in, in beer and wine. Um, so um, we are allocated a certain amount. And um, Massachusetts is pretty prudish about um, how many licenses that um, the legislature will agree to let you have. So <coughs> if we have seven licenses left, um, I, we're, not, we're not even up to the capacity that the state um, says that we could have. Um, so. Just so you're aware, these, these things are limited um, and um, they're set by statute. So there are licenses available. We'll have to make an appropriate decision based upon whether or not we think it's appropriate to have, um, to have um, alcohol at, at the 7-Eleven. But um, th we're well, we're not at the saturation point yet, according to the state, on how many um, establishments can sell beer and wine only so just so people are aware of the way that works um, okay uh, if there's nothing else um, I have a motion to close the hearing so moved second okay <coughs> motion to second any further discussion there being none all those in favor signify by saying aye
Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Okay. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Well, uh, if, I'll start. Um, I, I am not one to, uh, there's two ways to look at, at these licenses. Um, one is the, the, the idea that children will be coming into um, the 7-Eleven, um, which they do in every other convenience store and package store. Um, and the other one is um, whether or not you use the license to um, control competition. Um, I am not one to vote to deny a license. If I deny a license, it's not because I'm, deni I, I'm trying to limit competition, if, if that's what I decide to do. I don't think that's the appropriate way to use a license. If they're available, the state says <coughs> that they're available um, and that um, the community can handle um, that many licenses, then um, I'm of the personal philosophy that we let the market decide. Um, so um, that's where I'm coming from on it. Um, I think if if we do decide to grant this license, I think we should we should specify um, where the stuff is going to be displayed. Um, and I, I think we also have to mandate, and I'm sure that you would do it anyways. I'd be surprised if 7-Eleven said otherwise that you need to get your people trained and certified so that they're aware of what the laws are and how to handle sales. You, you. I'm willing to be helpful in anything you ask me to do. Okay. But you probably did that in Framingham too, right? Yeah. Right. And I went to class. Right. That's yeah. what I mean. I went to class. Okay. Yeah, I, so. I can send all my employees to the class too. Um, okay. So, I mean, those are my thoughts. <clears throat> Anybody else has any thoughts? I do. Um, sure. So, uh, I, I understand that they are trying to replace the revenue that will be lost um, with the new regulations on uh, vaping products and menthol products. So I completely understand the reason why they're looking to add something to bolster up their business. Um, I am a little bit concerned about the proximity uh, to another package store so close. Um, and also I'm wondering if this will start a chain reaction of other convenience stores looking to uh, do the same thing. Um, but it, as you said, and quite well, um, we do have these licenses available and this is a local business. These are local business owners and it's important that we maintain our local businesses. I know that we're working very hard to revitalize our town center and so having more empty storefronts isn't necessarily a good thing for us. Um, and I do feel comfortable that they um, will be taking the necessary steps to ensure that alcohol isn't sold to minors uh, and that it is well secured during the hours and days when it cannot be sold. Um, but I would like to have that restriction that if it becomes more than two uh, of the doors uh, and that display that was mentioned, that, that we need to know about it. So regardless of what we decide or what I decide or how I vote, that's very important to me. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, no. Can I just ask one more clarifying question? Just real quickly. There are no uh, if a license were granted, are there any additional consents required from 7-Eleven or that there's nothing required from a corporate end? No. Okay. So I'll be able to um, follow whatever restriction you're going to ask me to do. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to follow that uh, without any problem. Um, so, I mean, our, our, essentially our choice is yes or no, or yes with conditions or no. Um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the license application. Um, I think uh, these folks have far more to lose than others have to gain by trying to steal a can of beer. 
honestly, I don't think, I'm, I'm sure it happens, but I think kids uh, get alcohol in a lot of ways, but I don't think stealing it from stores is a way that they get it, is a prime way that kids get alcohol. Um, I, uh, though there are licenses available, that doesn't mean we necessarily have to grant them, but it does, it does indicate that some statewide standard is held to how many licenses are granted per uh, X number of people or population. Um, we have a, a, a store owner that uh, provide utility to uh, both our, many of our residents because of the design of a store. It's for people going by, so it's either residents or, or travelers through no action of their own. A major part of their um, revenue stream is going to be severely disrupted uh, in a few months. Um, they are seeking another legal means to uh, try to uh, make up for that loss. Um, I'm, I'm fully prepared to vote in favor of this license. With, um, I would certainly be agreeable to the um, restriction on the number of doors mm -hmm. and the, uh, I guess I'll call it the freestanding display. Um, as far as location of that display, I just, I don't want to make it so restrictive that then you get run into a corporate issue and then you're running back and forth. Um, 16 cameras, I got to admit, I was very surprised <laughs> to hear that. Um, we have so, two, two systems. Yeah. We have four cameras um, recorded by 7-Eleven and we have 16 cameras on uh, for our own two. So we so, have two systems. So, uh, I mean, as I've, I've expressed to, to the rest of the board and to anyone who hears what I'm saying, I'm in favor of this. Um, I, I also, though, want you to know that uh, we don't have many violations. Any. But we don't look at violations very favorably. Oh, yeah. We don't, we don't have any. Okay. We didn't have any. I saw all the green cards. Yeah. So, but I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm and even violation from the town. I don't have any violation whatsoever since I got the business. I mean, you've already been dealing in uh, uh, age-restricted uh, products, so you have some familiarity with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with this, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Samia? Don't have much to add, but you've been good corporate citizens for the last 12 years, and that's been recognized. We've had um, a change in terms of what your business model was through no fault of your own. Um, <laughs> I think what's important that I've heard are the answers that you've had, particularly with the young members of our community going there and that you have a number of people there. Uh, I like your answer there and that you're mindful and have multiple people, multiple people there. Uh, I think that the business clientele that comes to 7-Eleven, this would be a convenience for them. Um, hopefully it would not take away from other businesses. I think it would augment yours and not take away from others. Um, so what I've heard tonight, I'm in, I'm in favor of this license. Okay. Um, any other comments? No. Um, then would somebody like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Ms. Kessvan. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we, um, we grant a wine and malt beverages package store license for Amir Hanna owner of AG United Incorporated, DBA 711, 38 Maple Avenue, with the restriction which we discussed, that if it were to be more than um, the two doors, how do we put that okay. restriction we in? Have a, we have a plan that was submitted. Okay. Um, I think door number 1112 is what... So if it extends beyond door number 11 <coughs> and 12 and the display that the board would need to be right. notified. No, it would be a change of license, it would be a change of premise, so they'd have to come back and change state law. Do we have a copy of that plan? In it's the page small now. Sorry, it's page 23. Okay, what about hours of operation? Um, hours of operation would be Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. and on Sunday, 10 a.m. since 11 p.m. That's the same hours. So, 
It's not from 8? 8 a.m., excuse me. 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. I have to go back and look at it. Or um, on Sunday, 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. And uh, And no holidays. uh, No holidays, but the night before the holidays, we uh, are allowed for another half hour uh, to be like 11 a.m. In accordance with the law. Thank you. Okay, so we got hours. Um, There's no second yet. Um, I would add that um, all the employees need to be TIP certified. Mm-hmm. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Anything else? Did everybody have a chance to see which doors 11 and 12 are? Those are the ones up, up near the front of the store. Right. <clears throat> and just so I have clarity, there are three holidays they can't sell on, right? Uh, I don't remember, but it's by statute, um, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. They were out, but I just don't remember which ones they are. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, Christmas, in uh, Easter. Or the July, I believe. With the July, I think it might be Easter. Let me check. Whatever. Um, okay, so do you want to restate that motion? So. Sure. Uh, so I move that we approve the wine and malt beverages package store license for Amir Hanna, owner of AG United Corp Incorporated, doing businesses 711 38 Maple Avenue, um, with the following condition that if they were to increase uh, or just specify where it can be, that if they were to move outside of cabinets 11 and 12 or Cooler is 11 and 12, that, and the display, stationary display, they would need to come back before the board uh, to apply for a new license. With hours of operation Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 11 p.m., and the other hours in accordance with the statute, which allows till 11.30 uh, the day before the three specified holidays. Memorial Day, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, of which you will be closed. Okay. And, and tip all certified. staff need to be TIP certified. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, okay, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. You're all set. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so so the, the application will go to Boston now. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great night. Yep. <laughs> might have messed up here. All right, so our next order of business is um, a mid year fiscal update. Um, Mr. Mizakar, are you going to take us through? Yep. Mr. Chairman, I'll get started. Um, So I just want to take a step back and kind of um, remind everyone that we've consistently heard, whether it's a town meeting or in other venues, that uh, residents are looking for enhanced communications from uh, the town about what we're working on. And not really to be too exuberant, but especially a town meeting, um, most everyone seemed proud once they understood of uh, and impressed with what we were working on and what we had accomplished. So... Every day, I can honestly tell you that staff work hard to enable a high quality of life and keep the community vibrant, uh, making it a place where everyone can thrive. And uh, for that, I just have to thank uh, my entire team and and thank uh, members of the staff that are here this evening. Um, This update contains information from almost every department within uh, the town government. And um, to be quite honest with you, I had trouble paring down the information, especially on the accomplishment side. Um, and the challenges side as uh, they see what lies ahead of them. So, um, you know, this is certainly a pared down version um, and I can provide the board with any other details outside of this meeting that you're seeking. And I certainly encourage you and ask you to to chime in and ask any questions about any things that we address. Um, Again, so thank you to my team. Uh, I'm certainly proud of everything that we've been able to accomplish um, and the, the way they perform day in and day out. 
I think what's more impressive is that the standards and quality and the values that they work under. Um, if there's something that's not working or something that can be done better, um, no one uh, on this team shies away from it. And we know that oftentimes it's difficult to bring you uh, as the executive body these challenges that we're facing and, and work with you to try f to find ways. Uh, we won't back down from doing that, um, no matter how challenging that is, because we're all focused on um, providing the highest quality services to the best community uh, in the country and, and perhaps the world. So, so much has really changed over the last two and a half years since I started, and I'm grateful for all that. Uh, we're all focused and believe that we can continue to improve what we're doing and look forward to working with you as the board uh, to make that happen. And this report this evening is, is to update you on the accomplishments and the challenges and the general conditions of, of town operations, uh, the midpoint of this fiscal year, 2020. I certainly will touch on the financial situation we find ourselves in, the capital improvement plan that was approved for this fiscal year, accomplishments um, fiscal year to date, challenges that we see, upcoming trends, um, and some proposed strategic planning as we move into fiscal year 21. So uh, as far as the financial condition uh, from, from a very uh, general standpoint, I'll talk a little bit about revenue and local receipts, which is something that we always focus on really from you know, mid-September of, of the current year, the whole way through the uh, um, budget planning cycle. Mr. Snowden puts together the revenue manual and we spend an awful lot of time on you know, uh, this uh, aspect of our revenue stream represents 10 or 12%, but it's, you know, one that we have the most discretion on and is the most impacted by economic trends. So uh, at this point through the fiscal year, um, these numbers are through December 31st, 2019. We're slightly ahead of uh, where we were last year with 110,308 more at this point this year than, than we received last year. Excise taxes are all on, on pace to meet budget. Um, I do want to note to the board that hotel motel um, excise tax is down about $20,000 versus this point last year, uh, where we've collected about $60,000 versus the $80,000 at this point last year. I don't certainly know why. Uh, they flow in from, from the state. It's been consistent uh, from both quarters, but it, it is down. Um, on the bright side of things, um, Licenses and permits are up 22% uh, over last year at this time. Um, and uh, investment income is very strong. So we have a long way to go as far as the total number of local receipts, receipts that we've projected, which is a little over 11 and a half million. And um, <coughs> this year, um, so far, we've collected 3.9 million. The, as, as you're well aware, the vast majority of local receipts falls into a single category of motor vehicle excise taxes. And our biggest um, billing and assessment of that comes in mid-February. Um, and uh, we've projected a little over $6 million in revenue from that, uh, which makes up um, you know, the greatest aspect of, of the revenue that's yet to come for this fiscal year. So this is a snapshot of each one of our different uh, utilities on a year-to-date basis. Starting on the left side of the screen, we have solid waste fees. Um, we've collected 57% of the revenues that we've expected at this point in the fiscal year. And while we're talking about um, uh, solid waste, I did just want to note to the board that um, as you know, one of the things that we felt be most beneficial uh, to the financial conditions of this enterprise fund uh, for this year was our ability to negotiate a separate agreement with a recycling processing company, Casella. And that is certainly playing out. Um, I know many members of the board had commented that they read the article in the Boston Globe over the weekend where a lot of communities are struggling with the cost of disposal of recycling. I'll just remind you that our tipping fee uh, for trash at the incinerator um, is almost $70 a ton. Um, and to this point, six months into the fiscal year, our average cost to dispose a ton of recycling is $31.50. So um, that has ranged throughout the course of those six months from $53 the whole way down to below $19 a ton. So being able to have the community partner with us continue to separate their recyclables 
and have that separate agreement has really um, put us in a position where we're halfway through the fiscal year and only a third of the way through what uh, we expected to spend on the disposal of recycling. Sure. There were, uh, people at, at one point um, in the not um, too distant past were saying they, they wish we went to single stream. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of not going to single stream was cost avoidance. And um, this, it, reading the article in the Globe and seeing what the people would do single stream are up against now at $90, $95 a ton um, because they have contaminated, they have contaminated recycling. Um, certainly that decision to stay with the, with the split stream made a, made a, a big, a big impact, I think. That's right. I'm um, just going through the rest of these utilities at this point in the year. Uh, stormwater revenue is, is slightly below trend as far as the, the timing <coughs> of the year. We've collected 44% of expected revenues, sewer 51% of expected revenues, and water right on at 50% of expected revenues. And so we're certainly in a good position on all of them. I'm not concerned about stormwater. Um, we got off to a little bit of a slow start. It is a new utility. We had some accounts that didn't have water or sewer services, so we had to create new accounts for them. And it's certainly a, um, a gap that we'll be able to uh, bridge throughout the second half of the fiscal year. As far as overall departmental expenditures, we've ex expended 61% of the total operating budget on the town side uh, for the fiscal year. Um, uh, certainly not concerned by that number, even though we're halfway through. Um, there are certain um, items that we fund uh, faster than the fiscal year plays out. Not everything in our fiscal budget um, works out on a month-by-month -month basis. Things like ret our retirement contributions are front-loaded, insurance premiums are front-loaded uh, on general liability insurance. So we certainly have several cost categories that um, we quickly burn through the budget but serve us throughout the fiscal year. Um, every other uh, really department, uh, we're not seeing any major financial challenges. Um, I have up on the screen just a snapshot at this point of the reserve fund. We funded $233,000 or appropriated $233,000. We've only used $13,356 to date. We are looking at some other um, specific uh, departments that may need reserve fund transfers in the future. Um, the fire department, which is really due to some retirements uh, that came up in the early fall and uh, the compensation of uh, various uh, accrued time to members who have departed uh, and, our, and the necessity to backfill those positions right away to ensure staffing and safety of the community. Uh, the building inspectors department uh, due to um, some uh, staffing changes uh, where we've had to rely upon contracted services more. So this is not necessarily um, a deficit within, within that department, but uh, town meeting controls at the uh, personnel uh, salary and wages line and the expenses, and we've had to rely more upon expenses than salary and wages due to uh, staffing change. So uh, we'll actually be seeking a reserve fund transfer for $15,000 uh, at the uh, Finance Committee this Thursday. So we're all in all we're in a good spot. Um, we've enjoyed the 60 degree temperatures of this past weekend. Hopefully snow and ice slows down after a couple long durations, very high cost storms that chewed up a quarter of our budget uh, before we made it to Christmas. So um, we'll continue to monitor that and keep the board up to date as we go through things. A little further um, note on the expenditures, one um, line item that I'll continue to focus on throughout the course of the, of the year is our health insurance line item. Uh, we budgeted $11.9 million uh, within that line item. Our estimate based on enrollment as of uh, mid-October, we always take a snapshot after we get into the fiscal year. And um, the school department is kind of fully staffed and, and acclimated for uh, the year. Uh, our estimate at that point in time was about $11.8 million. So a uh, half percent margin on an $11.5 million line item is a, a little too close for comfort for me. Um, we have actually only spent 45% year to date, but the way health insurance trends, we have some, some of the later months of the year. 
um, are more expensive because of the way teachers um, are paid throughout the summer months. Um, and we have some very large payrolls uh, to, to get that through where the town's uh, health insurance contribution extends for several months in the summer. And then uh, the new, the way health insurance works is that we also, employees in the town also pays a month in advance. So June paying for July would be at a higher rate. So we have to account for any rate increases at the end of the fiscal year. So um, I see this budget coming in uh, very close. Hopefully we don't have any challenges. Um, and we'll continue to monitor it throughout the course of the year and update you as needed. <clears throat> Moving into the capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2020, um, I did want to touch on every project that um, was funded uh, through town meeting. I think we've made a lot of significant progress and I'm very proud of this. Um, the police station municipal campus feasibility study was $250,000 and we have selected an owner's project manager and uh, have come to terms uh, with an architect and we'll be executing contracts later this week. We've ordered the new fire engine and expect delivery uh, this June. It takes a long time to build a vehicle like that. We've ordered uh, the replacement for the 1988 uh, truck 10. February, February delivery is expected. Uh, the backhoe has been in operation since July of 2019. The mechanics lifts were actually delivered uh, late last week uh, after being fabricated and um, are on site on South Street and we'll work on installation as the next phase. And uh, the replacement of truck 24 uh, we expect delivery uh, sometime in the March time frame. In the Parks and Cemetery area, uh, we anticipate delivery this month of the replacement for the 1991 Truck 81. Uh, playground uh, improvements, we've identified um, a more appropriate approach given additional scope that has been identified and, and that will be included in the fiscal year 21 plan that we've recommended. So we will hold these funds and couple them together uh, with funds for the FY21 plan should they be approved. Um, for cemetery expansion planning, the consultant RFP is under development and we will have consultants in place and begin work uh, later this fiscal year. Uh, the sand pl uh, pro replacement is, the invitation for bid is under development and we will have that uh, in place for the spring. What, what is sand pro? It is a... It's a ball field groomer. Oh, okay. Uh, the four marked uh, police vehicles are all in service. Um, and the public building side, um, the underground storage tanks uh, all have been removed from the schools and various other locations. Um, uh, so that project is completed uh, with the exception of a little bit of monitoring at the high school um, where there's a small amount of contamination that has been removed from the site. Um, and we took delivery of uh, the replacement SUV uh, for uh, the maintenance division. Did you sell the 98 as an antique? We are going to put antique plates on it and <laughs> gift it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, we will. Um, there's actually a number of vehicles that are up on uh, public surplus for town auction uh, as we uh, improve our fleet so residents and others are able to bid on those. Quick question. Yep. So as we replace some of these older, significantly, oh, I mean, it was 15 in 1988, um, old vehicles, I know they're bigger vehicles, but are, are they are they more energy efficient when you purchase new ones? Yep. So yeah, they certain, certainly are. They meet the current emission standards, which some of the other ones didn't have to, given their date of manufacture. Um, and just along that same note, you know, the town, we know a couple towns around us were successful in the past, but we'll be exploring whether um, we have an opportunity to apply for funding through the VW settlement um, where heavy equipment can be replaced with more uh, efficient vehicles in the future. I know Westboro got a couple of vehicles, so it's something we have to really talk about and explore to make sure it's a good fit. But if it is, you know, we'll pursue that as well. Okay, great, thanks. So now I'm going to uh, move my way through kind of noteworthy items or accomplishments and I'm going to move quickly just in the, uh, respect to the time this evening. Um, we've had a lot of uh, new hires that, that we'll, we'll note throughout the course. I, I may have missed some that was not intentional. 
Uh, within the fire department, we appointed a new deputy chief and implemented the new public eye system, which uh, aids apparatus um, in their response. It's a, it's a GPS-based system uh, that uh, assists, <coughs> assists dispatch and operators of the apparatus to get to the scene, identify various public safety uh, infrastructure-related items like fire hydrants, et cetera. Um, and we recruited and sele selected seven new firefighters, four coming from the SAFER grant funding, and three uh, in replacement for retirements earlier this fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> as far as a noteworthy item within the police department, our records management system vendor uh, provided notification uh, that our computer-aided dispatching system and records management system has reached the end of life, and that uh, vendor will be going out of business, so we're diligently working to... Uh, find a replacement. Uh, that system will go out of service December 31st, 2021. So uh, IT staff and uh, police leadership have the lead in finding a suitable system to backfill with. Um, as far as sworn officers go on the police force, we have one new hire and two current vacancies, and we're going to line uh, the filling of those vacancies up with upcoming um, police academy dates where we've secured spots. Emergency management, we now have the deputy fire chief serving as the emergency management director, which is a change this year and I think is a better home. Uh, deputy Chief Colby has certainly hit the ground running on that and is doing a great job. Uh, within community development, uh, DPW areas, uh, building department, we've integrated, uh, this is the building inspector's department, we've integrated the electrical inspector into the department, which, which started uh, in fiscal year 19. Planning and economic development has certainly had a successful town center rezoning process. Edgemere Drive-In redevelopment is now the whole <coughs> way through permitting, which is obviously a significant uh, project within the community and will help the tax base. Can I just interrupt for a second? So they, they get their, they got their, um, they went through their permitting with the planning board. Now they've got to go through the MEPA process? They have, yeah, an ENF to file. Right. So that. Yep. Going to be another six months, right? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, it'll definitely be several more months. Uh, within Public Works, uh, Highway, the paving projects, Lake Street, Francis Avenue, South Street uh, were completed um, as scheduled throughout the course of, of the summer. Fall Street sweeping compliance was actually done in house, collected over 200 tons of material. Uh, we originally went out the bid to try to find a third-party contractor to do that, and we're unsuccessful given the constraints that come along with our um, NIPTES improvement or our NIPTES permit. So, thank you to the Highway Department for uh, being able to complete that. We appointed a new superintendent in the Water Sewer Department. Within Water and Sewer, we had successful main replacements on I Rita Road, Lake Street, Shepherd Lane, and Main Street. Uh, there's some work that still needs to be completed along Main Street, but uh, the, the vast majority of the main or the, the main itself is completed. Uh, we have service and lateral work to continue doing. We implemented the new unidirectional flushing program, which will continue even tomorrow, despite the fact that it's January. We'll take advantage of the weather when we can. We've moved forward with our hex chrome pilot planning and um, started PFAS uh, pilot planning and um, constructed the new solar array at the water treatment plant, uh, which should be commissioned within the next few weeks. We're just working with Selco to be able to monitor the output of that system so it can be managed properly. Within public facilities, uh, parks uh, replacement of the Dean Park bandstand roof um, and Assabet Valley Tech built sheds for both the, the boat ramp and Spring Street School, which is a huge benefit to the town. I noted the underground storage tank uh, removals within public buildings. Council, Council on Aging, we implemented route match tablets to aid in deploying van and scheduling <coughs> of, of rides for residents and installed a new COA director um, a little over a week ago. Health Department flavored tobacco ban and new regulations related to tobacco, et cetera, and education and notices related to the polystyrene ban that went in the beginning of uh, the calendar year. Within the Library Department, and we wanted to note youth services, a new youth services assistant position is making tremendous difference with the teen and youth within the community. It provides a steady presence for teens in more teen program opportunities. And within the first four months of the fiscal year, 
230 children programs are offered to 788 children, parents, and caregivers, which is, 7, oh, I'm sorry, 7,888 children, parents, and caregivers, which is phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> and one of the, a part of the library strategic plan that they've uh, done well in implementing uh, throughout the course of the fiscal year so far is developing and curating a stronger town information services to kind of be the one-stop shop when residents are looking for whether different services or different types of, of information on where to find things or things to do within the community. Administration and finance, um, the assessor's department, you know, managed the, the um, various, you know, the 1,207 changes that are associated with new growth, you know, that led to a new valuation of almost $73 million in, in new value for the tax rate. Uh, which drives uh, and results in our new growth number, which is important part of our revenue model. Uh, within human resources, uh, this one really took me back looking at. Uh, we had 32 recruitments, 24 new hires, nine being full-time, three permanent um, part-time, and 12 temporary part-time positions um, that have been brought on board just since July 1. So a lot of activity there. I'm not sure how we did it without a human resources coordinator position in the past. <clears throat> Classification and comp and study. Compensation study and initial implementation um, occurred in October, and additional information is forthcoming before the end of this month about the next steps that we'll take uh, for uh, compensation for employees going into fiscal year 21. Um, <clears throat> Within IT, that should be bumped out. Um, they were successfully completed a phone network switch upgrade for all town and school departments. And just a reminder, we're certainly continue to be proud of all the work that we put in to receive the AAA bond rating, which led to a July sale of general obligation bonds, uh, saving the taxpayers almost $4 million for the Beale project alone. And we certified the highest amount of free cash um, in the town's history of $8.6 million this fall from the last <coughs> fiscal year. The Board of Selectmen was very generous as we made it through the final stages of uh, the budget process and augmented uh, the personnel uh, board's the personnel department budget um, for additional funding for town-wide professional development. And that has led to um, a number of projects that I just want to highlight within the DPW area, executive development for two employees, goal development for seven, which is the entire senior management team there, supervisory leadership development training for, for four members of the management team, um, and sending two employees to um, multi-day customer service training. Uh, within the town manager's department, uh, the assistant town manager will be training, um, attending the leading educating and developing program at the University of Virginia later this month at the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service. Uh, we're participating uh, uh, in executive development and goal development of the entire staff. Across all departments, um, 27 members of the senior leadership team uh, participated in resilient leadership training and 18 members uh, participated in communication tendency training, both which I've found and seen have made their way somewhat into inroads into our culture um, and conversation already. When we're sitting in meetings, we say things to each other that we have never said before to make sure we're communicating well, and I think it's led to uh, better conversation and better outcomes uh, during those meetings. And um, 24 members of the town staff participated in mental health first aid training, which there was no cost to and provided by Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services. On to the challenges side of things. Um, within the administration of finance functional areas, we continue to struggle within the benefits administration area within the treasurer collector's office. Uh, there's a volume <coughs> challenge that's related to the amount of work. We're servicing um, upwards of 1,300 active and retired employees, managing all their moves, ads, changes, uh, and life events throughout the course of the year, um, challenged um, you know, by the different changes in the Affordable Care Act and uh, individuals staying on um, their um, parents or guardians. Uh, health insurance until the age of 26 and you know so that brings separate challenges especially with young employees um, early in their careers in our employee um, that's being handled by one single FTE so we will uh, making uh, 
proposals to enhance the amount of staff that we have in this area of business for the town. We, um, you know, that includes both town and school employees. Um, we've struggled filling the HVAC uh, position. We know it's the right approach to take, um, and we will continue to try to find the right person to uh, fill that role um, and become a part of the public buildings team. Um, we, Question there. Yep. What makes, I feel like that's been vacant for a while. What makes that so challenging to fill? Is it the, the certifications and the, the systems that the person would need to know? Or? Do, you, do you mind if Keith? Mm -mm. Not at all. Sure. The, 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 the biggest struggle that we're having is really based on salary, to be blunt. Um, so, so we're trying to recruit um, an HVAC technician and in the private sector, many of those HVAC technicians' uh, weekly income is supplemented by working on prevailing rate uh, projects. Um, so, so they get an extra bump in um, significant salary bump by working on those types of jobs. Um, our actual pay scale is good if they didn't have that um, type of work to supplement that. Um, and quite honestly, it is one of the if you went to monster.com right now, it is, it is like, or indeed, it is one of the largest categories um, um, for people that are looking, you know, employers are trying to find jobs because, um, as you may know, that, you know, trades are very difficult. Trades person <coughs> are very um, sought after. So trying to find any type of a trade, whether it's a HVAC technician, electrician, plumber, mm -hmm. whatever, um, is difficult. Thank you. So the public building staff continues to manage uh, roof leaks at the Parker Road School, which will be a part of the FY21 uh, capital improvement plan to replace that. Um, on the IT side of things, uh, Windows 7 is at the end of life and will no longer be serviced by Microsoft as of, I believe, tomorrow. <laughs> and we have replaced 70 <coughs> of the 83 devices that we started the fiscal year with. Uh, that had Windows 7. Uh, community development area um, continue to struggle with the challenges associated with non-permitted multifamily structures. Um, some of those illegally converted, some of them that may have been in existence prior to zoning uh, coming to be in the, in the mid-60s in the, in the community. It's a challenge both on the life safety standpoint um, and a difficult conversation to have with either new owners or existing owners who are trying to um, sell their property or acquire property at the best value for them personally. Um, it's certainly being balanced. We always will focus on balancing life safety issues uh, when it comes to structures like this because uh, that often leads, if it's not permitted, to very unsafe conditions um, for those dwelling inside of it. Many are renters. Um, utility infrastructure conditions that we kind of are uncovering with a new set of eyes within not so much water, but sewer, as far as the condition of, of pump stations and general infrastructure that we look forward to uh, sharing with the board and talking about in future meetings. Um, certainly a challenge to have learned about PFAS within our system and, and finding the most prudent way to um, eliminate that from our drinking water supply and filter for as, as much as we can for uh, any future substances that may become regulated within uh, the DEP or EPA realm. I mentioned public safety challenge, uh, end of life for our computer system, and we certainly uh, worked with our state partners on the challenge of Triple E outbreak throughout the summer months of this fiscal year. Trending community requests, uh, requests, excuse me. So I asked <coughs> departments to kind of identify what they're hearing. Um, and, and what people are presenting to them under uh, various conditions, uh, whether they're you know calling in or you know having those conversations with them out in the community. Um, several things have been identified, some across departments that so we just highlight to the board and look forward to working with you on them strategically. It's sidewalk conditions, lack of sidewalk, and interest in improving um, you know pedestrian access and mobility. Uh, within the community. Uh, the perception, and I want to stress perception of the trash hauler. Um, we're seeing statistics out of the DPW that uh, we've shared with the board over the past months that our call volume is significantly lower 
Um, but I feel like the community has not, um, still feels that the perception that the hauler is not performing. They certainly are. We look forward to enhanced services coming up in February with the new trucks coming on the road. Um, and um, we'll be able to attack the town uh, even more efficiently than we are Can at this point. Are the trucks, yeah. are they definitely coming in February? Mm -hmm. That is, yep, the latest we heard, they will be here in February. Um, ball field, infield maintenance, uh, which is part of our planning for fiscal year 21 as well, but it, you know, certainly been a challenge for the Parks Department. Uh, public safety, uh, records management for the third time. Uh, we, it's, it's such a critical system. It manages um, what officers see when they're going to and arriving on a scene. It's, it's critical information, and then also maintaining the records that are related to any calls that they go on. And within the human service areas, mental health support um, is certainly challenges departments, you know, uh, at times uh, when residents or individuals come into buildings with mental health challenges. And we certainly have, uh, I think, stepped up. And um, not only have we had the mental health first aid training earlier this month, we uh, participated in dementia friendly community training that was put on uh, by the residents at Orchard Grove. Um, and then just the library identified more hours, more programming and desire for the community uh, for children's IT training of, of the public. It certainly continues to be an ongoing request in that venue. Um, and uh, in administration and finance, in-person payment methods, the ability for multiple town departments to take cards and, and individuals to kind of pay in present day ways um, is something that, that we're hearing that we will certainly need to address to uh, keep up or catch up with the times in the future. I'll now turn to um, ways that we look forward to working with the board in the future um, uh, for fiscal year 21. You know, we, we want to focus on developing cascading set of goals based on the board's priorities that will align with the FY22 budget process and prioritize FY22 spending based upon that. Implement a performance management system to track those goals and monitor performance of town departments and staff and better utilize data in all the uh, decision making processes that we do. This is my mantra for uh, calendar year 2020 is to enable town staff and work to continue to build trust in the community, use proven innovation to solve problems that we've faced, and always follow through with what we've promised to do. Um, <clears throat> in, in developing those goals and working to prioritize items, I look forward to working with the board through an annual BOS planning cycle. Um, that is proposed really to play out um, in the early months of the fiscal year and establishing strategic goals for the upcoming budget year, um, identify any long range studies that would enable future year planning in the early winter months, um, get town meeting buy in and funding for this, uh, both the near and the long term priorities in May, make any revisions in June and then hear reports and uh, receive feedback from departments on their accomplishments in the summer months. Um, <clears throat> that planning cycle would be essentially mirrored but delayed um, oops, through individual departments. So departments would lag um, on that cascading goal cycle where the board would set goals and departments would backfill and find ways to implement those in the October and November timeframe, identify long range studies, December and January. In May, we'd make re revisions based upon what was funded and what wasn't at the annual town meeting and work throughout the early summer months to develop those reports for the board to continue to make prudent decisions moving into the future. And I also look forward to working with the board more like this uh, in future meetings with enhanced meeting content, providing you with up with quarterly updates on that performance management system and goals that have been established, financial updates, making that more part of our, our regular business cycle, regular updates on those long range studies and plans and, and uh, major projects so we can communicate both to you and the community better. Uh, in the coming fiscal year and beyond. So that's really the end of my um, update for this evening. I look forward to coming back uh, on a quarterly basis with this type of update to the board 
I'm happy to talk about anything in further detail if you have any questions. Questions, anyone? <coughs> Excellent report. Yep. Thank you. There was a lot of stuff to go through that quick. That was good. Thank you. All right. Um, just a comment. I really appreciate hearing what the challenges are. Um, it's often difficult to talk about challenges, especially in a setting like this, but I think that if we don't talk about them, then we can never address them. And so just having it laid out this way in the different areas is very helpful. And I also, um, because communicating with residents is very important, I like that there's a section here about what's trending in the community and what people are hearing, um, whether it be just in interactions um, out in the world or if someone comes into the office or calls town hall that we are keeping track and we are hearing what people are requesting and we are looking to see um, what what the patterns are so that we know um, what we're working on actually mirrors what's important to residents because sometimes I think there could be a disconnect even though the things that we do here every day are very important sometimes residents have things that are very important to them and it's good to see that reflected here Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is a great report. It's a great summary. It's very well condensed, yet full of a lot of facts and information that, that residents can glean quickly. Um, the one thing I'd like to see going forward together with the annual goals is the overlay of a strategic plan so that these that's the one step I think that we all need to work towards as we get in, particularly to the financials, which we'll be talking about shortly for fiscal 21. But I'd like to see that develop, too, and over the next few months leading into the next year. And then the goals below that, the strategic goals, will be fed from the plan, whether it's a five- or ten-year plan, with broader concepts that we've started to talk about. But I'd like to see us move forward on that, particularly as we start talking through 21 and looking beyond. Okay. Ready to go. Talking to move on to the budget? Yep. All right. <clears throat> So we can't afford any of it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start off by saying, you know, we certainly, uh, at least from my perspective, um, we wanted to be able to provide a board with a with an early look, um, a reminder on kind of the revenues, how they uh, played out, and what we're modeling for the fiscal year. Um, give you an early book at, uh, look at many aspects of the budget, really with the exception of the Department of Public Works. Um, as you know, we do this uh, these budget workshops in two phases, so we'll save DPW to the second phase. Um, a lot of changes have been made that, um, you know, in further, you know, forming the department and, and right-sizing um, the budget and reallocating things um, centrally or dispersed within the individual uh, departments and divisions with it. So we look forward to talking with the board on that at the next meeting. Um, one, so within the context of the available revenue, uh, we will be uh, talking uh, about the department's requests uh, during this workshop. So. Um, uh, you know, the revenue model certainly does not provide for everything that has been requested. Uh, we have been challenged a little bit more this year than in previous years with the amount of available revenue that, that we have projected at least this point and being conservative um, and trying to, demeet, trying to meet the demands um, and service levels that the re residents expect. So um, I will also, at the end of this, walk through the proposal for uh, fiscal year 21's capital improvement plan. So departments were asked at the beginning of the budget process to submit level service budgets as a baseline, uh, and service enhancements were proposed during departmental review meetings. Uh, they are included in these numbers that I'll walk you through this evening. Um, there are only a, a few exceptions uh, beyond the level service budget. Um, so. Um, there are no vast new service areas or no significant changes in the footprint of what we do or what we plan to do for fiscal year 21. Uh, we're for, uh, focused on continuing to be pragmatic and to keep up or catch up with our baseline services. So um, Shrewsbury certainly continues to grow as a community. Um, in fiscal year 20, uh, the assessed value increased for the, com uh, the assessed value of the community increased five and a half percent. Uh, and that's a total assessed value of $336 million. 
Uh, if we were able to apply uh, last year's tax rate to that uh, $336 million in um, increase in the tax base, that would yield $4.2 million in, in new tax revenue alone. Proposition two and a half doesn't allow us to do that, unfortunately. Um, but it just shows as the community continues to grow, the revenue model that we're allowed to raise under state law does not even allow us to keep up incrementally, which certainly is a challenge this year. Um, on the revenue side of things specifically, um, we are only uh, anticipating uh, 3,252,000 in total new revenue, which is a two, to, two and a quarter increase, two and a quarter percent increase. Um, the reason it's not two and a half percent is um, because we're, uh, the current model has some declines in local receipts, uh, given the uncertainty on this long run of economic growth that we've had. <coughs> Um, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> motor vehicle excises are a large component. Um, we've, there's been uh, some changes in the revenue model for the landfill ash revenue that we anticipate, and that's led, led us to a conservative standpoint within this budget. <clears throat> as far as unrestricted revenues go, uh, that would be revenues that we can use um, outside of those that are raised specifically for debt service or exempt debt. And utilities, we only have about 2.12% new revenue year over year, or $2,389,000. So um, the key reductions in revenue that were presented in the revenue manual are used to this date in the budget process is a reduction of almost $370,000 in new receipts and the elimination of the use of free cash um, for specific line items within the operating budget of $416,000 as part of our financial objectives and principles that we've set forth. On the state aid side in the revenue model, we are using the $30 per student uh, increase that's part of the Education Reform Act. And at this point, we're only using about $20,000 in new general, unrestricted general government aid. I read an article today, the State House News Service, that the governor and the legislature have agreed that uh, new revenue growth for the fiscal year 21 budget model will be set at 2.8% increase over fiscal year 2020. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to increase the unrestricted general government aid, which is a, a small portion, about $3 million. Uh, so we'll be able to be a little more aggressive than the $20,000 increase before we roll out fiscal projection one, and we'll hear more from the governor uh, later in the month on that before we have to produce it. Um, <clears throat> current year revenue trends for the state is very good, 4.7%. That's 2% higher than they projected last year at this time. Um, the governor and, and uh, the lieutenant governor have committed to increasing unrestricted aid at the same rate that the general um, budget revenues increase. So we should expect a 2.8% increase in that unrestricted aid. Um, to put the 2389000 in new unrestricted revenues in context, um, I'm currently holding 9.2% increase in health insurance because those rates won't be set until the end of February. Um, that's $1.1 million. So you take our $2.3 million in new revenue and reduce $1.1 million from it. It $1.2 million in new revenue to spread over a balance of about $110 million in other line items within the budget or a 1.3% increase. Um, so this year has been challenging, needless to say. We will continue to work on the revenue model. Um, and f and um, <clears throat> reduce any expenditures that um, are unnecessary, uh, but we do need to do our best to continue to maintain the services that the uh, community expects from us. So this is a total summary of the revenue, uh, projecting one million four one hundred forty-seven point seven million dollars to be used uh, in the FY twenty-one budget process. That's a little small. <clears throat> so um, I'll walk the board through um, the functional areas of administration and finance, public safety, retirement, community development, and human services. Um, so these are all the budget areas that we'll discuss this evening. Again, we're talking about department requests, so that may include additional staff and additional service areas beyond what is um, provided today, but it's, it's really nothing significant. 
Um, on an aggregate basis across all town departments, actually including DPW in, in this number, you'll see in the, in the, in the lower part of the screen, um, in the FY20 budget, we have 236.98 full-time equivalent employees and departments uh, request an increase up to 242.68. So I will highlight that within each functional area, again, with the exception of DPW that will be handed um, <clears throat> at your next meeting. So within administration and finance, which includes, um, a, uh, I think, 12 or 13 different department areas, um, we are seeing an increase uh, from 22.4 million to $23.8 million. This would include uh, the most significant increase within the health insurance line item, um, that $1.1 million increase which hopefully we can lower once rates are actually set and spread it throughout the course of the budget. Um, <clears throat> within the total personnel that are requested, um, this, this requested funding would uh, increase staffing levels from 47.71 FTE to 50.21 FTE and include an additional part-time benefits coordinator position and two maintenance craftsmen within the public facilities department. Uh, I will remind you uh, with regards to public facilities, um, we're just shy of a million square feet of space that the public facilities division maintains. Um, that number will grow to over a million with the implementation of the new bill school. Um, these positions that are requested are um, just to maintain the, the current space and are not related to the bill project, at least at this point. We do continue to look at the, the models that are used within the public um, facilities division and uh, the uh, use of contracted, I don't know how it changed there, the contracted uh, cleaners versus in-house custodial staff. One of those maintenance craftsman positions are for an additional custodian to staff the Parker Road Preschool and um, cell co facilities at the Parker Road School. We currently do not have any custodial staff there, and when there's a, a challenge or an incident at the school, we have to just de deploy a maintenance craftsman from a, a diff, uh, additional or from a different location and pull them away from their job. Um, so with, with a partnership through Selco, we would like to add an additional uh, position uh, within the Parker Road Preschool in those areas down there and eliminate the use of contracted cleaning services, uh, which would provide a savings of roughly $10,000 a year. Public safety, um, <clears throat> there is... A requested increase of one full-time equivalent, which is a uniformed patrol officer within the police department. Um, so this is made up by police, fire, and emergency management. There's no uh, dedicated FTE in emergency management. The director receives a stipend. Um, this is our um, largest, one of our largest areas of growth within um, the department budget requests. Um, a lot of it has to do with the four additional firefighters that have been brought on. Yes, we are receiving a 75% of their salary, their base salary, um, through a safer grant, but we do have the ancillary costs that are associated with those and the maintenance of the equipment and the turnout <coughs> year and um, other various um, <clears throat> wage and earning opportunities and, and provisions within their contract that we do have to fill on uh, through the town budget. So, um, you know, we're experiencing a, a about a 10% increase uh, within the fire department budget from the department request at this time. So um, we'll continue to monitor that and fund what we're able to. Um, I'm uncertain to whether we're going to be able to fill any of these additional FTEs, so uh, we will scrutinize those before um, we produce fiscal projection one for you. Can I, can you yep. Fire it's gonna, it is requesting a 10% increase. And that doesn't include paying the full boat for the four firefighters? Right. So that's, <clears throat> it's not quite 10%, but it's, it's near 10%. Yep. Um, that just seems like a big drop. 
Yeah. It, if it's if it's all salaries and wages we're talking about. Well, uh, there's a lot of aspects of it are salary and wages, but it's you know the maintenance and replacement of eventual maintenance and replacement within the cycle of four additional radios. They'll go through the academy, and their turnout gear will uh, need to be replaced at that time because of the intensity of the academy. So there's just, you know, a lot of uh, additional costs that come along with that. So that all that glitters is not gold. Yep. There's certainly, yeah, town responsibilities uh, in funding. You know, there's more than just the base salary, which, right. which the grant covers. Well, the retirement uh, funding, pension, and OPEB. Uh, we are able to see a $1 million reduction uh, in the amount that we're funding. Um, we anticipate the actual aerial analysis that uh, will be done early this year will show that the town has fully funded its outstanding pension obligations uh, as of this January 1st. So that's an accomplishment that's really two years ahead of schedule. Um, there had been conversation with this board about um, continuing to make conservative revisions to um, the mortality tables and which would, you know, extend the amount of time that we have to supplement the funding for the retirement system to make sure that we're meeting all of our future obligations, but we are able to reduce it by a million dollars. And again, as we've discussed, we're being conservative with the use of that funding and uh, with the acknowledgement and understanding that we will have to open the new Beale School for fiscal year 22. Uh, we do not want to put ourselves in a situation where <clears throat> we don't make the best use of this funding. So it really, these, this million dollars in funding is technically being used to fund a portion of the capital improvement plan or one-time cost in fiscal year 22. Free cash balance will remain higher. Uh, than it has or than it otherwise would have because we're not using that million dollars in free cash. And then we'd be able to draw down on that free cash in fiscal year 22, along with additional funding that wouldn't be needed for retirement to really account for that leap that we'll have to make in, in opening the Beale School, uh, which will be quite costly from a staffing and then just having an additional building um, to operate and maintain in the future. Community development area of the budget. Um, <clears throat> this has been really a part of the discussion in previous years. The uh, building inspectors department has requested funding for a second as full-time assistant building inspector. Currently, we have one full-time and one part-time. Uh, we are currently augmenting town staff, as I've mentioned before, with um, <clears throat> third-party contractors to help us with our, with our inspections, so we would be able to draw down upon some of the f uh, expenses uh, that are uh, being spent on contractual services and roll them into um, the salaries area uh, on top of the funding that we have for the part-time position. It still does require additional funding year over year, um, so it's something that's currently under consideration um, but is being challenged with the re um, revenue challenges. Yep. I thought we had funding for another building inspector or assistant building inspector, but we couldn't find somebody to fill the position. We were still carrying yeah. that budget item. Yeah, we're, we still So is this, is this the same thing? We're talking about the same? Okay. Yes, same it's, thing. It's not really new. It's, we haven't been able to fill it. We haven't it's been already able to budgeted. fill it. Uh, we don't have full funding for both positions we knew going into this fiscal year that we wouldn't make a hiring decision until later in the year right. so if we were to make a decision and hire a second full-time assistant building inspector for the rest of the year we do have the funds to kind of be able to cover that now okay um but it, it does require additional funding year over year because it is an, an an overall would require an overall increase uh, in their budget on a complete annual uh, fiscal year basis <clears throat> Within the human services aspects of uh, the town operations, this includes Health Department, Council on Aging, Veterans, Commission on Disability, and Library. Um, funding has been requested um, to maintain service levels and uh, requested some additional staff to increase outreach coordinator um, hours from uh, roughly uh, 0.48 FTE to 0.64 FTE. Um, 
add a, a half-time reference librarian, increase the number of hours dedicated to library pages, which is equivalent to about a third of an FTE, <clears throat> and increase library summer aid, which is equivalent to about a half an FTE. So the uh, majority of those changes falling within the library uh, in their desire to continue to carry out their strategic plan that the Board of Trustees have put in place. Debt and interest is um, increased year over year to accommodate uh, both principal and interest payments for the Beale School uh, for the first time. So fiscal year 21 will be the first full year uh, for principal and interest. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see the increase from 10.5 to 12.9 million dollars. This is excluded, so the funds are there to cover these costs. There's no FTE that are associated with this. It's managed through the manager's office and the treasurer, collector, and the accountant. So again, I apologize. It's um, hard to see on the screen. Um, I have provided the individual departmental year-over-year um, -year comparisons from FY21 and 20 and actuals from 2019, 18, and 17, um, and some basic statistics on the right-hand side that um, identify the changes over current year funding to the budget year. Um, this is really more for the board to digest and ask questions if you have them now or you know, certainly in the future and in the run-up to the development of Fiscal Projection 1. So that just continues on to the next slide. I'd like to move into a discussion on the Fiscal Year 21 Capital Plan. <coughs> So um, as proposed, the fiscal year 21 capital improvement plan would include funding $1,877,544 worth of improvements. Um, this is less than the $2.4 million that were funded in fiscal year, in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 20. Um, we continue the model of using uh, any uh, monies that were previously allocated to capital improvements um, through debt service that was not excluded into this, uh, increasing that amount up to $108,000 <clears> to fund this. Um, again, and as I said before, it's a little bit different funding model this year, utilizing the um, roughly million dollars that will not be used for the retirement system into these one-year costs so that they, those funds would be available in future years for <clears throat> ongoing obligations. Um, that the board sees fit to allocate at that time. Um, there are a number of projects that I'll quickly walk through. Um, they include the full funding of the remaining poll pads, which were partially funded in fiscal year 20, which will provide great efficiency and service to both early voters and uh, voters on election day and making their experience quicker and um, verification easier. Uh, the replacement of non-apparatus vehicle uh, officer response vehicle for the current um, Ford Escape um, <clears throat> with a, a vehicle within DPW and engineering, funding $200,000 in design and improvements to public ways and public assets, um, and emergency action plans for Old Mill and Newton Pond Dam. What, why is that a capital? What's that? Why is that a capital item? Sure. Emergency... Emergency action plans for the dam. Why is it? It doesn't seem like it's a capital expenditure. Um, I mean, I think it's borderline. The the asset, obviously, the dams themselves, which the, the action plans are for, are capital improvement. But um, oh, I'd it's really a plan for, for capital the, improvements. Well, it's a plan for the dams. Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Good. Um. On the highway side of things, uh, replacement of another frontline vehicle and a roadside mower. I just want to take a, a second to talk to the board about this because I would anticipate questions. Um, in the past, we've used um, a roadside mower uh, with in-house, um, much smaller piece of equipment. It's the same piece of equipment that we use 
I believe, for the, the snow plowing and maintenance of sidewalks. Um, over the summer, we uh, took a different approach and rented a vehicle. It cost about $10,000 a month. We were only able to secure it because they're in limited supply. We had it for about a month. Uh, it was very effective, um, and we were able to get a lot done, though still not <clears throat> a full summer's worth of work, which we'd be able to do if, if we owned a vehicle. Um, given the limited availability and, again, the $10,000 price tag per month, <clears throat> we'd be able to um, easily recover the cost versus leasing it within a, a three-year period. Um, <clears throat> so I do look forward, you know, this summer we did have calls about um, overgrowth and delays and, and having that vehicle earlier in the season that allow us to stay ahead of that uh, versus what we did this summer. So I'm recommending funding of that. <clears throat> Within uh, Parks, Cemetery, and Recreation, the funding of ball field renovations at Dean Park, cost of $145,000 to the, the capital plan. This is really a $195,000 project um, with $40,000 coming from the Parks gift account and a $10,000 contribution from Little League. Um, playground improvements at Dean Park, which I previously mentioned, additional scope. Uh, this will be combined with the previous funding of $50,000 for $175,000 in total improvements over the two years. Within public buildings, the replacement of the roof, which was identified as a challenge. The Parker Road Preschool, it's actually a $630,000 project. Uh, $500,000 would come from the capital improvement plan of free cash <clears throat> or this funding model and 130 from the Green Communities through Green Communities grant. Uh, the replacement of a vehicle, um, additional replacement of aging um, custodial equipment, floor scrubbers at three schools, and the design and the remodel of the formula lease space at the high school where the Assabet Valley Collaborative operates so we can make improvements to that space in fiscal year 22. Replacement of four marked police vehicles, I will note that um, the Ford Interceptors starting in fiscal year 21 are moving to hybrid models. We will not be purchasing them in FY21. We'll allow the rest of the country to work the bugs out, but we will <laughs> purchase them in fiscal year 22, so we will have hybrid. We'll begin purchasing hybrid police vehicles in fiscal year 22. Um, <clears throat> and as we now move into the still young but maturing library um, in order to um, start the cycle of replacement of the public computers within that facility. We're funding $43,000 for the replacement of 36 public computers, which is a third of all the computers at the library. Is this the first time? Yeah. And one of the main reasons that <clears throat> this is being funded through the capital plan is um, if it was embedded within the library budget, it would kind of skew the amount of money and require additional funding to go through materials. We could certainly afford that, but it allows us to kind of not arbitrarily increase um, that in the year that that amount in the years that we need to replace the computers by funding it through this mechanism. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, because that that affects the materials expenditure requirement. The library affects yes. the amount that we receive from the state as far as our library state aid. Right. Right. Yeah. So we'd put ourselves, you know, behind the eight ball twice if we funded it through their budget. And that's usually pretty close. If I recall, last year it was like an extra two thousand dollars to make sure that we, or maybe a thousand dollars to make sure we got an extra two thousand dollars. But trying to get and leverage as much as possible from that library state aid is very important to the, uh, the functioning of the library. Correct. Questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Sammy. The only a lot of information here, obviously, is still fluid, but the thing that we'll have to pay particular attention to is every decision in 21, given some of the facts that you've that talked about for fiscal 22, to the extent we can almost have them side by side so that every decision we make, we know immediately what we're looking at in 2022. Right. Uh, and Typically, I know it's one year with looking out several years, but I think given the sensitivity of uh, what we're looking at coming online in 2022, not only in terms of, of having an additional facility and staff, but also additional expenses related to operating, the, operating that facility. So 
just make sure, be mindful so we don't end up becoming into a, some sort of deficit situation. So I know we'll do that, but just yeah. two, two year approach instead of one. Great. Anyone else? No. Thank you. No. That was a lot of information early in this early in the process. It's good. Yep, it's helpful. Thank you. Let's see where we're going. Good. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, now we'll move on to item 10 is to review and act on. Um, this says it's a road race request, but it's actually a two mile walk uh, for the Shrewsbury High School, uh, by Shrewsbury High School seniors. Um, um, Sophia Morano and Madison Sandowski for the first annual mental health awareness um, walk at Oak Middle School on Saturday, April 4th at 12 p.m. Um, so, what's the pleasure of the board? Move approval. Second. Okay. We have motion and second. Any further discussion? There be none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Okay. Um, I think we're down to correspondence, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Item 11 is a letter dated January 2nd from um, the governor and lieutenant governor uh, to the town manager um, stating that we'll be getting an extra $98,983 um, in Chapter 90 funds this year, so noted. Item 12 is a letter dated June, uh, January 2nd from Joanne Campo, Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. Um, regarding a recent audit of dealerships um, from time to time, um, that office um, does, I guess, surprise inspections at, at various um, dealers um, to see that they're complying with the uh, notifications for the Lemon Law and, and um, use, use vehicle warranties. And um, they visited four. Um, new car dealers and they all got 100 percent so that's a good thing so noted item 13 is a letter dated january 6 from susan Arborn, osborne 249 south consigman ave regarding a water lien appeal mr um mr mizakar you you're working on that right yeah Why we will we will the staff isn't dealing with that we'll review it to <clears throat> determine the request and make a recommendation if any is needed to the commissioners. Okay. <clears throat> Item 14 is a letter dated January 6 from um, Xi Win Chen, a Six Crane Circle. <coughs> we got a request for a cultural um, council appointment. Those do start in February, right? Yes. Sir. So, what I would suggest is they certainly they have capacity for for more people there, but. Um, instead of making an appointment now, we're just we're going to have several of them in February. Just do them all at once at the end at the same time. Right. Assuming, assuming that we do it. Um, item 15 is our email dated January 6th from Bridget Rubin, um, associate member of the ZBA, um, informing us that um, because of other commitments, um, she um, has resigned as an associate member, so we'll need to be looking for someone to make that replacement. Item 16 is an email dated January 7th from Robert Raymond, CMRPC, um, regarding uh, Central Mass traffic uh, counting results, um, various roads throughout the community um, they, they did this year. Um, and interesting to see they go back like the in the 80s or earlier, they've got the history of it to see how the traffic mm -hmm. uh, has increased. Um, so noted item 17 is an email dated uh, January 10th from Jane Seibel, Spring Street School, regarding Community Reading Day. Um, this is a letter inviting um, any of us um, or all of us uh, to uh, participate in Community Reading Day, which will be March 6th, um, starting at 9.15. So noted, if anybody would like to go, do they want us to apply directly to them? I don't remember. Or I did. Through the office. Directly. directly to her? Yeah, but I can also. Okay. Um, item 18 is an email, a memo dated January 10th from Andy Truman, town engineer, regarding the Old Mill Road sidewalk citizen request. Um, well, I guess there's issues on the, on, on being, having the room to, uh, install those sidewalks um, 
it wasn't clear from the letter. He wasn't saying it couldn't be done. He was just saying we need the money. We would need the money to do it. Um, there is potential right away concerns right. as we get closer to Harrington. Uh, right. Where the stone walls come in. Mm -hmm. But the end of the corner where, the, where um, um, that resident was talking about, it's the most dangerous part of the road. And it's, they stopped on both sides of it. Um, and there are a lot more people walking there. But anyways, it, it always comes down to money. But um, So we'll have to, um, we'll just have to keep that are added to the list of potential projects. Um, item 19 is a memo dated January 10th from Andy Truman, uh, Chief Hester, uh, Nick Repetka, uh, regarding the blind driveway sign request on Gulf Street. Um, they're recommending, based on accident history and the posted speed on the road, that that sign probably isn't necessary. Um, I think the posted speed and the actual speed are two different things, so I might talk to Andy offline about that because what if, if people were traveling traveling at the at the posted speed I think it wouldn't be an issue but um, anyways uh, we got the response from them on that on that issue and item 20 is an email dated January 10th from Angela Snell superintendent of public facilities and parks regarding the first DPW newsletter um, that, that I, I told you an email I think it was great um, I, I think people really look forward to seeing those. So, um, I don't know if anybody else had a chance to read it. I thought it was done well. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know you were a graphic artist. You could lay that out. We had assistance from Jessica, um, who's our admin in public facilities, helped with the layout. So. <laughs> but she did a good job. Okay. Anything else to come before the board in open session? Uh, the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. We are adjourned.